Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for being here today. Welcome to North Carolina, my new home. I think it's the fourth. Um, my wife in Buenos Aires one time said, don't look into the internet, I'm not gonna move. And she did that three or four times. So um, here we are. Um, I'm sorry I had to change the title after what I heard yesterday uh, from Ashley, Jim, Cassie, and I'm glad I did it. So I changed the uveal melanoma past, present, and future for you are not alone. Okay, there, is, there are a lot of people working on this. Um, and we should admire you because you are the real fighters. You are just uh, part of the team. And um, we're gonna show more after that, after the end of the, uh, the, you know, the presentation. These are my disclosure. So I, I, I'm an advisory board for um, advisory board for Castle and for IDEA, which is a new method of looking for treatment to cure this disease. Collaboration, inocular melanoma. In the 80s, the collaborative ocular melanoma study, the government spent millions of dollars in research. Look all the reports that came from it. And that was in the 80s. And until, I don't know how many years, 2000, 2000 and something, there was no more collaboration. Shame on us doctors. And when Sarah and, and Greg first spoke to me and told me their ideas, I said, well, I wish you luck to make the, to make the ocular oncologists working together. And I'm glad it's happening. And I'll show you that it's happening. The comms had three um, main arms. Was to diagnosis of medium and large size tumors, melanomas, medium sized tumors treatment, comparing enucleation versus brachytherapy. <clears throat> and to the point that some centers, they quit the study because they knew that brachytherapy had the same prognosis as enucleation. Because of the, uh, because this disease is rare, we're always behind. <coughs> Look at the day of this picture, 2010. We're talking about some of these things today, nine years later for uveal melanoma. So this is the PET scan of the patient and everything you see here in black is metastasis from cutaneous melanoma. And after two or three cycles of targeted therapy against this mutation that is known for cutaneous melanoma, the patient showed this progression. So we're getting closer, we're still not there, and I'll show you why we cannot be like the cutaneous melanoma people who are living longer, who have control of their disease many times. How many of you have heard of the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network? Just a few. So I want everyone, of you, everyone here to know about this. The NCCN guidelines, it's, um, um, it's, um, I'm gonna tell you what that is, but it's uh, giving you some guidelines for patients. Um, translations of the NCCN cl uh, clinical guidelines are meant to help patients with cancer talk with their physicians about the best treatment options for their disease. The first question I ask the patient when, when it's referred to us is, okay, what did you Google? Have, have you Googled? And some patients say, well, I did not, but my, my daughter did. And, um, well, be careful what to Google. I mean, Google is great, but I think things like the Melanoma Research Foundation is a better source to find what's happening. Short story about the power of communi communication. Um, I was being interviewed to come to Duke and I, I didn't say anything, I couldn't say anything to the people at, at Yale. And then a patient that I was seeing at Yale, who came from Boston, she sat on the, on the examination um, chair, and she, she looked at me and she said, is it true? Like, true what? That you're moving? 
The only one who knew about it was my wife. I said, how do you know? And she said, Facebook. <laughs> Could you please explain? Well, there was a patient from um, Dr. Muthunjayak, the one who was at Duke first, who was complaining that he was leaving and this guy muttering is coming. And my patient saw that. And then it happened the same to my patients or to other patients all over the place. So we can hide anything today. <laughs> Anyways, so let's continue with the NCCN. Uh, it's a non-profit alliance of 28 leading cancer centers devoted to patients' care, research, and education. I think it sounds very familiar, right? NCCN is dedicated to improving and facilitating quality, effective, efficient, and accessible cancer care so patients can live better lives. There are different resources. But here's my point. The first NCCN guidelines for uveal melanoma was last year. Do you understand what I mean by collaboration? So there are other collaborations um, within different groups. There is a group, we are part of it, Collaborative Ocular Oncology Group that is, uh, has been working together on trying to find um, prognosis, um, class one, class two, I'm sure you all know about that. There is a second one going on that's a, about the specific mutation called PRAIM. We're still on the enrolling phase. They expected to have about 700 total patients in three years. We are enrolled all the centers together, more than a thousand now. So we're at 1,100, that's the new goal for this collaboration. You all know about uveal melanoma, I don't think I need to say much of this about this, but uveal melanoma is different today than in the 90s, in the 80s. By saying uveal melanoma, it's not enough for the diagnosis. Uveal melanoma was first name, last name in the past. It's not the case today. It's uveal melanoma and what else? Is that a class 1A? Is this a disomy 3? Is it a class 1B? Is it a monosomy 3? So there is more information because not every uveal melanoma carries the same treatment, prognosis, etc. We're at risk, light eyes, first skin, ocular melanocytosis, BAP1 mutations. Who heard about the BAP1 mutations? Good, just a few. The BAP1 is a bad guy. BAP1 is a mutation and we need to know, and this is the difference with cutaneous melanoma, this is what happened. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, ago they found what the mutations are for cutaneous melanoma. Which one are those? BRAF and RAS. There are specific treatments for those mutations. We are on the process of finding the treatments for the specific mutations for uveal melanoma. As I said, not all the uveal melanomas are the same. There are some associated for choroidal melanoma, some associated with different mutations for ciliary valley melanoma. The choroid continues to be the, the most common place where the uveal melanoma happens. Now, we know that it's a rare disease. However, it's the second place in the human body that melanoma can happen. Number one, skin. Number two, the uvea. Third, about 2,500 new patients are diagnosed with uveal melanoma every year. Two years at 5,000 people. So, um, yes, it's a rare disease, but I think there are a lot of people affected by this. What are the symptoms? Blur vision, flashes, floaters, no symptoms, pain, red eye, etc. I tell every time the patients, when you see those symptoms, please, please don't think you have a tumor in the eye because <laughs> it's like having a headache and going to have a CT scan. No, you take an aspirin first. <laughs> Uveal melanoma can affect even younger people. The youngest I, I met, he was five years old when he had the uveal melanoma. I saw an 11-year-old with three melanomas in one eye. The 15 year old girl, she had a suspicious lesion, long, long talks. She was treated, but she knew she was going to lose her vision. Good treatment, vision loss. 
there are some lesions that we mostly know that there are um, melanoma. And there are some that we call that they have um, what we call chronic appearance. These white spots are called drusen. We want to see drusen in these small lesions. However, they can grow too. So, yes, but this was a less aggressive uveal melanoma. Standard of care, I don't know. I said this about 10 years ago in Boston, and uh, there were some patients in a meeting like this. They were mad. They were mad at their doctors. Why I was not offered to have a biopsy? Uh, well, we know better today. And I cannot say the standard of care. Please do not be mad at your, at your doctor if this was not done. There are some reasons why your doctor doesn't want it. This is our opinion. This is some people's opinion. Nobody owns the truth. There is the AJCC, American Joint Cancer Committee. There is now, um, after evaluation of more than 7,000 patients, and T1, T2, T3, T4, is size for the tumor. Now, this is an important slide. <clears throat> These are, I'm sure you're familiar with class one, class two, class one A, class one B, class two, monosomy three, um, disomy three should be around here. Well, this is just lower or higher risk. This is not, things are going to happen, things are not going to happen. We've seen patients, class two tumor patients who um, they never have metastasis. And we've seen patients class 1A who have metastasis. There are other factors involved. And here's the problem. <clears throat> this is why we need more collaboration and more research. Um, you can, this is um, the, um, the BRAF and NRAS are mutations for cutaneous. So there are different mutations for uveal melanoma and everything starts around here. So you can treat, you can find something here and then we're going to have the problem around here. So let me explain this better. Um, everything starts from the normal cell and ends on the metastasis. Some patients may have higher risk for metastasis and some patients have lower risk for metastasis. And we're trying to find the targeted therapies for each patient for different mutations. So this story, and then I'll be finished. This is a story of a 20-year-old boy, blurry vision in the left eye, 2020 in the right, 2400 in the left. Maternal great grandfather had an ocular tumor with liver metastasis. That was the ultrasound. The, the, the patient had a biopsy and it was confirmed to be a uveal melanoma. The eye was enucleated and he had a class two epithelial cells, which is an aggressive tumor. Some of the, um, the, uh, the cells, the, the, the specimen from the tissue was sent for a sequ DNA sequencing. And he had BAB1 and he developed um, nodules in the lung. His mother had a BAB1 gene. She was a carrier for the BAB1 gene. And don't forget that the maternal great-grandfather died from liver meds from an ocular tumor. So, um, this kid was diagnosed with this tumor in 2010. He was diagnosed biopsy-proven lung metastasis a uh, few months later. He's still alive with no treatment. How can that happen? We don't know, but that's the key we need to solve. Now, I, I called the, um, the, um, the doctors at Yale last week and they, so they told me that there is something going on and he's receiving immunotherapy but he lived with no treatment for almost nine years with, with, um, with uh, lung meds. So my time is up. I'll be happy to answer questions. I, need, I know I need to talk about treatment. It's a continuation of this, um, of this presentation. So I'll see you in a little bit. Okay.